very much everybody for joining us today and welcome to our RMIT Digital Guide launch. This represents the culmination of a project myself and a team of RMIT researchers from the Department of Information Systems and Business Analytics that we've been working on in partnership with Hume Libraries funded by Alia to produce this digital guide. So the guide focuses on developing, enhancing and sustaining digital literacy programs for culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you. My name's Naomi Whiteside and I'm joined today to facilitate this session by my colleague, Professor Vanessa Cooper. Uh, two members of our research team will also be presenting the digital guide and a little bit of background about the project. They are our project team lead, Dr. Hun Ro Tran, and our colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Tate. We're very grateful to also have presentations from our colleagues, our partner, Mika Mellons from Hume Libraries, and Dr. Ellen Sayada Abdi from Alia will also be presenting today. Uh, after the presentations, we'll have a panel discussion and our presenters will also be joined by Associate Professor Tina Du, also from Alia. So thank you very much. Let's make a start. And acknowledgement of country uh, before we make a start. And I just ask that if you haven't already, if you could mute your microphones, that would be fabulous. Thanks very much. Okay, so RMIT University acknowledges the people of the Woiwurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT University, bear with me, I'm just having a bit of a technology fail at the moment. They are ready to go. RMIT University respectfully acknowledges the, their ancestors and elders past and present. RMIT also acknowledges the uh, traditional custodians and their ancestors on the land and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. Okay, so as you are no doubt aware, this session's been recorded. We've had a number of requests from colleagues and we will be sharing this recording with all of you uh, next week after the recording is uploaded. Thank you very much to all of you for muting your microphones. If you could also uh, mute your video unless you're presenting, that would be much appreciated. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be having a series of presentations to kick off the session and launch the digital guide. We will be holding over questions until the end of the presentation. So after all four presentations, we'll be having a panel discussion that will be facilitated by my colleague, Vanessa. So if any thoughts come to mind, questions arise as the presentations are taking place, please do add them to the chat and we'll be happy to work through them once we move on to the panel discussion. So, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Hun Bo Tran to tell you a little bit about our project. Over to you, thanks Hun. Thanks Naomi. I'll just let a few more people in. I think there's a whole rush of people coming in. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I'd like to welcome you once again to our presentation and our launch of our digital guide. So just as a bit of background to the project and why this project came into place, um, we started looking at what was happening in this space. So looking at the cold community. So in 2020, 7.6 million Australians were born overseas and about 30% of that is um, speaks another language at home. So you can see that about a third of the Australians actually speak another language besides English. And so there is a big cohort out there that where English is not their first language. So this is classified as CALD, which is culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, we wanted to look at the digital aspect of it and the digital literacy aspect of it. And we see that as an important skill set that comes along with what's happening today. Um, you see that most of the resources and the services that are being offered today make use of some form of digital literacy. 
For example, if you're applying for a Centrelink application, you'll need to go online and do it. If you're looking at getting a driver's license, you'll need to do it. Um, if you're going through and checking your student's reports or your child's report online, again, that needs to happen as well. So you can see the importance of digital literacy skills. And what we also wanted to do was see um, what's happening in this space and what libraries are doing to support this. Libraries have been fantastic in the way that they run programs and support programs. And this has come out of a 2019 report from Alia. And this is where we, we pick up the project from. So in 2019, Alia produced a report where they looked at um, programs that are being offered across Australia in terms of services that help migrants and refugees. Um, for this project itself, we did start off by looking at um, refugees. However, it was quite difficult to identify who was a refugee and who wasn't. So what we did was we expanded it to culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So what we wanted to do was really see how this is happening. So we looked at what programs were out there, but how these programs are working in this space. And so what we did was um, through the guide and through our contacts, what we did was we were able to partner up with Hume Libraries who had extensive experience in, in this space. And Mika later on will talk about what her library does uh, and how they facilitate uh, these programs. I'll move on to the next slide. So what we wanted to do out of this project was to identify, document and communicate a framework for developing and sustaining uh, digital literacy programs for Carl communities across Australia. So we wanted it practical and this came from the um, project advisory panel where we had Associate Professor Mary Carroll and Dr Paul Michia uh, assist us along the way. And through that, what we did was we were able to look at the literature that was out there, look at the programs that were running, and then also interview people along the way and people who were running these programs as part of Hume to come up with something practical that could be used and could be applied across the board. And later on, my colleague Lizzie will um, run through what the digital guide looks like itself. So in terms of what we did with data collection, uh, we went out and we had a look at the literature that was out there and we did an environmental scan. So what's happening in this space in Australia? What programs are running? How are they running it? Why are they running it? And so on and so forth. And what was being said? And to, to give us an overall view of, of what's happening in Australia, what we're finding was um, programs were spread, they were vast, they were wide, and they were, um, they were just specific to each library or each um, community space. So what we wanted to do was take this and produce a guide where people could look at it and have tick boxes and tick off and saying, are you doing this? Is this what you're doing in terms of getting these programs off the ground? Um, what we ended up doing was from the literature and from what's been happening in the area, we've produced some questions that we asked our um, interviewees, so the people who participated. And these people from Hume um, were all levels who were involved in the program. So from the tutors who were producing the programs and um, actually delivering the programs, all the way to the managers and um, management who were looking after these programs and, and running and administering the programs. So we got a, a wide range of people involved in the project itself. What I'll probably want to do now is provide you with a bit of context into our partner. So I'm now going to hand it over to Mika, who will, who will actually let you know a bit more about Hume Libraries, what they do, what programs they run, and then we'll move on to Ali to have their little bit. Thanks. Over to you, Mika. Thanks, Hon. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you all for joining us because this has been such an important and um, uh, something that an important project and something that we've uh, we've worked on with a lot of love, if anything, because this is a this is something that um, Hume Libraries are very passionate about, and so it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to share it with everybody. So Hume Libraries. Um, is uh, located at the northern fringes of um, the metropolitan area of Melbourne. And uh, let me just get here to the next slide. Uh, so basically, uh, it is uh, a place of great contrast, lots of diversity. Uh, the residents from um, uh, within that live within the municipality come from 156 different countries, and they speak 153 different languages. Uh, of the community that we have, 35.7% are actually born overseas. 
The other um, challenging factor that many of our residents have is that they are um, that probably about 23 to 24 percent of the households are uh, earning a very very low income. They're uh, in in sort of the bottom quarter of what um, the incomes for um, average Australians are like. So um, that then couples with another challenging issue, and that is that there is um, about twelve percent of households still not having a stable internet connection. So the issues, they all these issues combined, end up being something that. Um, uh, Hume libraries are very aware of and that we feel that is important to be able to assist our community in. So uh, let me just get to the next slide. Um, we as a result have five service points across the municipality. There are three very large libraries in the Hume Global Learning Centres, which uh, many of you may be aware of because um, there, there have been, uh, there's been quite a lot of um, exposure uh, nationally, even internationally, uh, about our uh, global learning centres. Uh, and the uh, the library in Craig, the Craigieburn Global Learning Centre also uh, earned the uh, inaugural uh, International Library of the Year uh, in 2014. So they are they are very well appointed. Um, big libraries that are very well used by our uh, community. Um, there are approximately 28, nearly 29% of residents um, are members of our libraries, um, but the use of our libraries by these members are very, is probably very different from what they may be uh, compared to um, other areas in, in Melbourne. So we are probably in the lower percentage as far as borrowing cons is concerned, but very, very high usage of our programs. So these programs then, um, they uh, range uh, from early literacy and we do a lot of that because we have a very young community and they include bilingual storytelling. We also uh, deliver quite a lot of digital literacy and technology programs, and they are being delivered not just in the libraries, but there is an outreach program for those as well. Uh, we deliver health, wellbeing and social connection programs. Uh, there's a focus on career and jobs just to ensure that the prosperity of the city is, um, uh, that there is a focus on that. And then we have uh, English conversation groups because of the high um, high level of uh, the high percentage of people in the city that have English as their language. So they have uh, a community that they speak at home. Uh, and then there is also a very extensive school holiday program. Now, these are the community language that we are approximately delivering collections in. So as you can see, there's quite a few of them. Now, these are not all extensive uh, because it is also, and certainly there has been in COVID, uh, quite uh, an issue with uh, collecting um, materials in other languages. But by the same token, uh, it is important that we make sure that whatever we are able to lay our hands on, that we do uh, make those available. Uh, the two biggest languages within the municipality and, this, and therefore also within our collection are uh, Arabic and Turkish, uh, and the total collection, and that includes obviously the English, is uh, approximately 180,000 items. Um, now, the, the, the program that we are uh, basically discussing today is a digital literacy program for the core communities, and so they are um, our community technology program. And so we've got technology uh, tutors available who speak other languages. The resources that we make available to them, we make sure that they are translated. Uh, and we have the programs available in every possible format. So if people are able to come in, great. If they want to do this in an outreach location, fabulous. Uh, but at the same time, there may well be people who would like to be able to do this over the phone. 
so we we will make sure that the delivery of these programs is done in such a way that is most comfortable for the person who may be able to take advantage of it. So here we have a little list of what that actually means. So the outreach uh, means that there is technology one on one, um, that we do basics classes, we do bilingual classes, we have separate classes for seniors and uh, MS Word, MS Excel are basically one of the uh, two of the things that are um, being um, offered sort of most uh, often. Let's go back here. The, these are the ones, if you look at these three boxes, these are the ones that have been very popular during COVID uh, for obvious reason, because these were basically the types of technology issues that people were working, on, uh, were working with. So uh, using Zoom on your phone, uh, how to use a QR code system, how to use Zoom on your computer, and more recently, we are also, um, we've introduced a vaccination certificate support program just to make sure that people are actually um, assisted with um, the downloading of their certificates from MyGov into the Services Victoria app so that the two work together seamlessly and that will then assist them in their daily lives. So that is the conclusion of my part of this presentation. I'll hand to Naomi. Thanks so much, Mika, for sharing a bit of information about HUME and of course for the partnership and engagement for yourself and the whole team during the project that made this possible. Uh, now it's my pleasure to hand over to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Elham Sayad Abdi. Uh, bear with me, we appear to have lost our slides. I'll just get them back for you, Elham. So Elham is joining us today to share a little bit of practice from Alia, the group who funded this research. So at this juncture, uh, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Elham. Excellent. Um, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. My name is Elie Abdi from Latrobe University Library uh, with Associate Professor Tina Du from University of South Australia. I co-chair the Research Advisory Committee on ALIA. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with ALIA, uh, it's the peak professional organization for the uh, Australian Library and Information Service sector. Um, the Research Advisory Committee uh, is the committee that among all other activities every year review and assess research proposals that are submitted to ALIA for its major research funding award, the ALIA Research um, Grant Award. The proposal of this study um, was one of the applications that was submitted to ALIA uh, for this award a couple of years ago. Uh, our committee reviewed and recommended this study proposal, this study's proposal for um, funding from ALIA. And following the presentations today, um, I'm so glad that ALIA was able to fund this study. Um, truly a very capable team of researchers, um, very interesting research, so very well done the research team. And if I want to give you a uh, bit of background um, and uh, a bit of details about Alia, as I said, um, this is um, co-chaired by um, Tina and myself. We share responsibilities. Um, we are very much uh, privileged to have a wonderful team of LIS professionals um, on our committee. As you can see, a mix of LIS academics and practitioners who sit together on RAC and uh, Research Advisory Committee and make it one of the unique places where the strength of LIS research and practice come together. Uh, we meet every second um, month, usually for one hour, and of course virtually given everyone is um, placed uh, based in different uh, locations. Um, on a research advisory committee, we basically advise the ALIA board of directors on all aspects of LIS research in terms of theory, policy and practice. We support ALIA um, to creating its research agenda to further develop uh, its research activities and resources and support. So, for example, those all day pre conference research related workshops uh, at ALIA conferences are all uh, organized and run by our committee. Um, as I mentioned, um, 
Alia provides some funding for research, and a good immediate example of that is the funding that was awarded to um, this research um, team's study. Um, our committee supports Alia to raise awareness of this of these research grants, um, but also implement the awarding of grants. Uh, this major the major award as I mentioned, is the ALIA Research Grant Award. Every year, ALIA funds uh, one research project um, up to $5,000 for two years. And again, in 2020, uh, this award was given to Juan and their team. Um, for this specific award every year, the applications are submitted to ALIA by the deadline of uh, 30th of June. It comes to our, the applications come to our committee for assessment and evaluation. Based on the outcome of the assessment process, one project gets um, is recommended for funding and gets funded by Alia. What I would like to emphasize here <clears throat> is that this is um, a research award for both our practitioner and academic colleagues. So uh, both groups are encouraged to apply for this award. Um, and of course, they need to be ALIA members. Um, what I mean is that don't feel that you have to be an academic to um, or have to propose a theoretical research to be able to apply for this award. Research into practice is extremely valuable and highly important. So if you are a practitioner and interested in research, please be encouraged to consider applying for this award next round. Um, even if you don't feel confident or comfortable um, to write a research application, but have a really important um, problem to solve, consider partnering with an academic uh, colleague. Preference is always given to partnerships between the two groups. Um, we also write, our committee also write for the LIS um, community in each issue of Insight magazine. There is usually a one page from our committee members related to the theme of that issue. Um, and uh, this one, sorry. And most of the time you might be interested um, in research, but not have enough time um, to get directly involved in a research project, um, but would still like to contribute to the LIS research uh, practice. You may like to consider becoming a, a research advisory committee member. That way you can still contribute your passion and insight and interest in research. Every two years um, or so, Alia puts a call for applications for new RAC members. Uh, that's when you can apply to become a member of Alia Research Advisory Committee. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, absolutely feel free to write to Tina or myself if you have a question. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Ellie, for sharing that background information about Alia and for your kind words and support for this project. It's much appreciated. I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Elizabeth Tate, who's going to show us around the all-important digital guide that we're here to launch. So uh, bear with me. Just move across. So Lizzie. Um, would you like me to stop sharing now and move over to you? Uh, yes, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Naomi. So I'm just going to run you through the digital guide, which we have just quite recently got the final version of, and I'm delighted to say is available to download from the Alia website. So if I just share my screen. Perfect. So I'm just going to run you through the guide. Oh, excuse me. As soon as I've done that, my screen has changed. Um, could this colleague just confirm that that is now the correct version on the screen now? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it's classic Teams moment there. Um, so here's our digital guide um, that we've been uh, telling you about thus far. And as I've said, is available on the Alia website. <clears throat> Um, so just a, another quick shout out to our partners who have been crucial in the development of this guide. Thank you very much to Mika and colleagues at Hume and to Alia for funding this project. So this guide was developed and distilled as a result of the partnership working with Hume and some of those um, best practice and previous research that Hume, that Hume drew attention to right at the start of this presentation. So we've got a little bit in here about Hume Libraries and about um, the services that they provide. 
And through interviews that were conducted by our colleague Brendan with various people who were involved in the design, development and management of the programmes, we distilled the knowledge that had been gleaned down into this digital guide, um, which will aim to assist people who are developing digital literacy programmes for called communities. As we said, the feedback that we received throughout this project from our partners and also from our project advisory board, Mary and Paul, indicated that what we really needed to produce was something that was going to be practical um, and very usable for people who are working in the profession and are aiming or currently designing um, programmes for called communities. So we took the findings from the interviews and distilled these down into a series of categories. And these can be summarised as uh, community engagement, uh, people and programmes. Community engagement focuses on the needs analysis of the community, on partnership working and communication. Uh, the people side focuses on staffing and management. And then we've got the programmes themselves that focus on format, design and resources. I won't take you through absolutely all of these in, in every point of these in detail um, because this is available to download at your leisure, but I just want to highlight some of the key points of each of these. And we started off with community engagement in this guide because as you've heard from Mika and it's, it's evident from other research in this area, community engagement and having great connections with the local community is absolutely critical to our understanding and also in terms of meeting the needs for delivering successful digital, digital literacy programmes. And that came through in every interview that we conducted. So it was really important for that to come um, up front here. Just point us out as well that um, the guide has been designed so that you can tick boxes. We we're, we were aware that obviously there's a great diversity in terms of communities in Australia. Um, not all communities will have the same profile as Hume. Not all, um, not all libraries will be delivering the same types of services. So some of these points might not be applicable. So we do have a, a box here for not applicable that may be um, ticked if that doesn't suit what you're looking to do. But other than that, then we've got boxes of to do, underway and done which can be referred back to at various points and um, during the development and delivery of programmes as kind of a, a reminder and a checklist. So conducting needs analysis is obviously something that comes through pretty strongly. Um, there was uh, uh, some mentioned by multiple interviewees that you didn't want to be duplicating efforts. So you wanted to be able to map and evaluate what else was happening in the community and target resources that can be quite scarce to the areas that needed it the most. Partnership working, again, really um, strong theme that emerged from the interviews and, and the things that came through here were in particular about trusted relationships, um, cross promoting programmes via community partners and indeed developing partnerships with organisations. An ally to that is raising awareness and communicating and promoting uh, the programmes through the channels that the community uses. And that is in terms of the of where people would learn about things as well as translation into um, community languages. The next um, key section that we developed is um, in terms of the people. So that's the library staff and management. <clears throat> the points that came through here were the importance of um, recruiting staff who could speak the main languages of the community. Um, who were engaged with the community as well and had good strong links and also the digital literacy side as well. So that it was important to have staff on board that were both connected to the community and also um, had the skills and training in order to be able to deliver these programmes as well. Adaptability came through really strongly as well. So there was a lot of the people who we spoke to who talked about how they tailored and their, their programs and their delivery to suit the groups that they were working with and that they brought their own style and flair to that as well. On the management side, we know as with all um, programs that are delivered in libraries um, that funding and resources are critical to this. And we also identified a role of management um, in terms of capturing the knowledge sharing um, that was from the tutors and from the staff who were working with the programmes. So as I said, we had um, lots of amazing innovation that was developed by members of staff 
and that there's an opportunity for that knowledge to be captured and disseminated more widely in order to share best practices. Obviously, with anything um, digital related, and you can see from some of the examples that Mika was telling us about earlier on, there's an importance of security and confidentiality of, um, of, a, of personal information that's being gathered. And something that came through as well was the importance of communicating that to clients as well, because there could be um, information that they have that is, that is confidential and they need to know um, about some of the risks of, of that person potentially um, um, being leaked elsewhere. And our final um, section here is about the programmes themselves. Once again, Mika gave some great examples of some of those programmes that were being developed. And the sense of uh, being a partnership and a co-designed effort um, between the community and the library services. We also could see from what Mika was saying about how those changed over time and responded to the current needs of the community just most recently with the um, with the, the the sessions that she was talking about um, linking up the the um, vaccine uh, certification, for example. What we found was that um, that our, our interview said that you couldn't have a one size fits all approach that often you needed a mix of individual small group sessions, as well as some drop in consultations. There was also a range of locations that were identified, so some would be offered in library and some would be in mobile sessions. <clears throat> Giving a bit of variation as well was seen to be quite important in terms of having the program scheduled to meet the community needs. So, for example, some could be run during school hours, some could be after work. And in some cases, it was also identified to be good to have some train the trainer sessions whereby partnership organisations could extend the reach of the programmes. <clears throat> The sessions themselves, um, quite a lot of thought has to be gone into the design and delivery of those in order to meet the needs of the communities. Hands on practical sessions were deemed to be the ones that were most appropriate. And I mentioned already online safety being embedded in the session design to raise awareness of that too and information and digital literacy associated with it. Once more, we've got um, the, the strong suggestion of having a set of bilingual uh, program support resources. Um, again, Mika gave some examples of those. And bearing in mind as well, the range of uh, technologies that clients could be using. So, you know, you would want to have, for example, tablets, laptops, mobile phones, as well as having um, sessions that were available on for Mac or Windows computers. So this is, that's just a very quick run through of the guide. As I said, it is available on the Alnia website for, for further um, consultation. And we'll be very happy to answer questions after um, I've finished here and also by email, should you have any further questions um, for us. We would envisage that this could be used in conjunction with other resources that you may have developed. Um, and we are always very keen for some feedback. So please let us know your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. So bear with me, I'll just uh, load up our PowerPoint slides again. And while I'm doing that, it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Pro Professor Vanessa Cooper, who is going to take on the panel discussion moderation. Over to you, Vanessa. Hi, thanks, Naomi. I can see that there is actually zero questions in the chat uh, at this point for me to moderate. So I'd just like to invite people if you uh, have questions, raising your hands to propose those to our panellists uh, or pop them into the chat. Um, in the meantime, though, I guess I'd like to ask uh, a question or two myself to kick things off. So um, for, I think uh, Mika and Lizzie, you'd probably be the um, people to pose this question to. And I, I guess I'd just like to um, get your insights into the key advice, if you had to summarise in um, very briefly what advice you would give to other organisations in implementing digital literacy programs to cold communities and other diverse communities, what would that advice be? Think, Mika, you're on mute. I 
my little mouthpiece up the top of my head. <laughs> I'm not, uh, it doesn't show me on my screen. Um, so from my point of view, the 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 thing that I think will would have stood us in good stead is being very very aware of the community, know your demographics, uh, know the community leaders, and be very organised um, and know where you want to head. So if it is a program that you are going to um, to start off and commence, then make sure that you know what your goal is at the end. Um, yeah, that, that would probably be my main advice. Uh, as it is probably with many projects, you need to actually work towards it with the goal um, in mind. So uh, yeah, know your community and know what it is that you're hoping to achieve. I think I'd echo that as well. That, that's certainly what came through most strongly from, from the interviews. And I'll add to that as well. It's, it's about targeting resources that we all know are, are pretty scarce into the right areas and doing that in partnership with communities um, so that um, the programmes that are developed are, are flexible, they're across different, utilising different types of technologies, um, but also responding to what the current needs of the community are and um, having and being able to adapt as required. So uh, I think that, that's certainly what came through most strongly for me. Okay. Thanks, Lizzie, as well. I can see a question there in the chat from Alam uh, in relation to um, clarifying how this guide differs from existing guides, if indeed there are any, any differences. So um, I'm not sure who might want to take that one. Um, Perhaps Lizzie, if well, we, we did have a look at what like, the guides that were out there, but we couldn't. I don't think. I think it's fair to say we didn't find something that was addressing this this in in particular. Um, and also, I'd say what we really tried to do this was with this guide was to uh, make it as practical as possible and have something that people could pick up and use and adapt to their their particular service and personalize it, um, you know, as as required. So I'd say that was our, our key differentiating points. Yeah, I think that there's certainly um, consistency, if you like, with other digital literacy um, research, and it's sort of, it's founded on that really in the sense of the literature which was reviewed. But I guess it's that tailored uh, to the library context and um, drawing on um, expertise across those areas. I can see Carl, if you've got your hand up, if you'd um, Pose your question, please, to the panel. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Vanessa. And uh, in extension of uh, LM's remark, I also feel this is a is a great uh, resource. Uh, but my question would be, uh, as uh, an archety archetype academic, where from here? I've myself been involved in a in a project uh, gamif uh, gamification of. Uh, uh, information for uh, Pacific Islander use uh, about climate change uh, several years ago and it took us quite a number of years to uh, as academics uh, get something out of that project. Uh, so I see a wealth of, uh, of data here both on as a practical guide, wonderful work, but the team, and again, probably my, my question, well my question goes to everyone, uh, how can you lift from the guide and from all the interview, how can you lift this uh, on a further level telling us, and I am now speaking as the uh, editor-in-chief of the Australian Journal of Information Systems, uh, how can you lift this on a level, especially for the younger academics, to exploit uh, that gold mine you are sitting on uh, uh, to furthering not only practically, uh, but maybe also academically, scholarly, uh, in that field of tension, that really fascinating work you have done. Thanks, Carl. Great question. And um, I'm sure hearing from a C editor in chief from a journal that uh, the academics on the team are certainly interested um, in your comments and how that, that can be achieved. So um, do we have uh, somebody from the panel that would like to comment on that? Probably most appropriately would be Lizzie, but even Naomi and Hun, if you wanted to chime in on that. Um, 
it would be good. Thanks so much, Vanessa, and thank you, Carl, um, for your thoughts on that. We're actually in the process of preparing a, an article reporting on the research in more detail for the Jalia journal, the, the journal that Ali looks after. So that's coming to fruition and we do hope to submit that uh, before we finish up for the end of the year. Um, certainly uh, our invitation in the next slide at the conclusion of the session is for anybody who's uh, in attendance today to reach out. We are very uh, committed to this area and very much interested in progressing this uh, through future projects. So we do welcome the opportunity to collaborate um, and we'll certainly be happy to take offline the discussion, Carl, the opportunity to publish in Aegis as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Naomi. There's a question in the chat from Sally to you, Mika, um, in relation to um, Hume Libraries, are the digital literacy learning programs delivered by li library staff or external facilitators or a mixture? Um, probably need to go back to uh, back into history a little bit. So this was in um, in the early 2000s. This program was set up uh, as part of the learning community department, and it was not uh, located in the libraries. It was a separate team within learning community. Um, over the years, um, just for a whole variety of reasons, um, eventually the program has been structured under the libraries uh, and the, the staff that were managing the program and that were delivering the program have now also been structured under the library. So we do have a group of separate um, people who are called computer tutors. They are the ones who are delivering the programs, but over the next few years, we are hoping to incorporate that group of staff into um, the more generic uh, library staff. And that means that uh, the staff that will be delivering that program will also be delivering um, a, a plain library services, uh, customer service on the floor and things like that, just to make sure that staff um, become multi-skilled uh, and that we have greater flexibility in the way we can assign people to the various tasks that need to be done and that includes this program. Thanks Mika. So there's a question in the chat from Trish before we then I can see there's a hand up um, from Delvin as well but we'll start with the question in the chat because I think that was there first. So from Trish, uh, was there anything that surprised you in the research and the development of this guide? So um, I, th I think I'll start with Lizzie um, from the perspective of um, the research team but also would um, be curious to see whether um, Mika in terms of the end result if there is anything that surprised you in that um, sense. I think very... I'm not sure. Pardon me. <laughs> no, no, go on. Um, I guess it wasn't so much a surprising thing, but something that I thought was definitely something that we needed to share was, and I, I repeated this before as well, of being adaptable and about the range of different activities that the staff um, undertook as part of their work. And really, people spoke about, you know, um, it being being flexible about changing and adapting, you know, not just to COVID, but uh, in response to client needs um, and differences in the community that they've picked up. And so um, having a way, I think, of, of having the flexibility for, for staff who are delivering these programmes to be able to do that, but also to capture the knowledge, to share it between the teams and potentially more widely as well is something that I would really recommend as, as coming through strongly from, from, from what we've found. Thanks, Lizzie. And Mika, you, you were um, starting to say something too in response to that. Yeah, I, uh, in, in the response to the question whether there was anything that surprised us, I'm actually quite pleased to say that no, it didn't. We, when I saw the final version of the guide a few days ago, I thought actually this, this is exactly what we do and how we do it. So um, I'm actually really pleased with the end result. Um, and knowing that uh, the, the program that we deliver is is um, of of a high standard, and I suppose it's probably a benchmark to a degree, 
Um, I was actually really pleased with the way the the end result has now been developed. And uh, now there was for us, there was no surprises in it. This is exactly even though it has never been crystallized and summarized the way it has done in the guide now. This is exactly what we do in the development of certainly of this program, but to a greater extent, lots of the other programs that we run as well. Okay. Thanks, Mika. I think yeah, it'd be really great to also um, hear more about uh, the applicability of this and usefulness to other libraries and organisations. I can see in the chat, for example, there's a comment there in relation to how uh, Fairfield CD Open libraries uh, conduct some of their um, digital literacy programs and sessions as well. So it's uh, useful to see those insights, and hopefully this will be a way that um, organisations can share, look at, compare, contrast, etc. what others are doing. So um, your patience, thank you very much uh, in getting to your hand up there. Lucky it's virtual and not um, physically there. So Del Delvin, your question, please. Yeah, if it was physical, it would remind me of the uh, the grounding I used to receive when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, thanks everyone for a really great discussion. Um, uh, my name is Delvin. I'm, um, from uh, Action Lab. Um, I, I, I was really fascinated by the work, um, much needed obviously in the context of everything that's been going on. Um, I was, my question was mainly around um, the kind of how it links with the work of other cold organizations, um, particularly maybe in, um, in the Hume setting. Um, and, the, and the reason I asked that question is because um, we've been doing a lot of work with um, um, yeah, Victorian government and the, and um, cold community organisations, seeing them as a, a very useful and very important link with the community members, um, particularly you know cultural and faith based organisations who do a lot of work that now is coming to the fore. With you know suddenly everyone's realising how important a role they played in reaching those communities. So I wonder, um, is there some links already with? community organizations you've explored through this work or are there plans in the future? Um, yeah, because there's a few things we're thinking of, particularly around building granting literacy among those organizations and digital capacity building. Um, but it really nicely complements what you're doing at the community level. So that's my long-winded question. Well, well, great question. I think there's probably a number of dimensions there that different panelists could probably tackle in that respect. So I think if we could have, um, insights in response to the question from both the academic panellists uh, of from Hume, but also from Ali, it would be interesting to see what potential role for research collaborations that might be facilitated through uh, Alia. So in any order, I'm not sure who'd like to kick off if we wanted to start with the academics. I think yeah. Hun Yor might come off. Yeah. So if we start with you, yes. then I'll, to I'll Ellie start. and then to Mika. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. So what we did initially prior to this project was um, have we had a roundtable with other organisations that dealt with it. So we dealt with um, refugees, organisations, arts and community centres as well, um, just to get their input, just to see what's happening in this space, what is needed and how they were delving and dealing with this space and how they were interacting. We also dealt with um, AMES, which is the Adult English Migrant Services. Um, that was also one that we brought on board. So that provided us with context and, and a way to move forward with this project what we really needed to be doing. And then obviously we used our partners in, in Hume in terms of their expertise and what they did and how they worked in this space. Um, so we, we did do our background and, and look at organisations and how they worked and what was needed in this space as part of it. And then we built into this project. Um, I'll hand over to Ali or Tina to describe what Ali does on that behalf. I think Mika would probably need to, Mika would, would probably discuss what she does with community groups as well. Tina, did oh, you want to say something? Yeah. 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 Thank you very much for, for this great uh, uh, presentation uh, presented by uh, both the RMT colleagues and uh, uh, Hume's libraries. Um, I think this is a, a, a you know fantastic um, um, demonstration of the collaboration between academics and the community libraries and um, our practitioners. You say uh, from Maker's presentation, there's a, a good practice already there um, in their community uh, delivering of the programs to the 
uh, their community members. Um, and then we have the collaborative, uh, you know, collaborator from academics. Then they report, then they do the study and report their case and broadcast it to a wide community. Um, so I think this is an excellent collaborative example. Um, and for the uh, community um, collaborations, um, I think it's also important to um, extend this research. Uh, for example, um, as Kwan, uh, Han mentioned about other organizations to verify or test this uh, guide um, and then um, makes it more um, you know, ac applicable to other communities and enhance the robust of, of this guide. There will be uh, maybe the next step you could think about. And also the sustainability of the funding, um, you know, as the, the project finished now, so what's the next step and the ways um, more funding source could uh, uh, sought from? Could be sought from, yeah. And what I can add to that is um, in funding um, this type of, um, you know, research that research applications that come to us, um, to ALIA and to research advisory committee, we usually give um, the preference to the ones that are in collaboration. We give preference to collaboration to, you know, um, to applications, to research ideas that bring research and practice together, that bring academics and practitioners together, that bring um, looking into the idea of looking into a real world problem, but through a very solid and thorough way of investigating that. Thank you. Uh, Miki, did you have anything you wanted to add from the Hume Library perspective there? Um, no, there's probably not that much that I can add to that now. Um, I was I was looking at some of the comments in the in the um, chat though, so I'm happy to continue with a couple of those because there's a there's one question there that in particular I wouldn't mind um, answering, which is the one at the very end. Yes, if that's no. okay. Yeah, sure. And there's also one for you um, specifically around the um, uh, paid versus volunteers. I'm conscious of time, but um, yeah, uh, wouldn't mind tackling those in response so to the chat. Paid, paid versus volunteers. Um, we only use paid staff, and and, and this is done very deliberately um, because we need to make sure that. There is um, firstly a level of um, a predictability around attendance, uh, which unfortunately occasionally there is an issue with volunteer attendance, certainly that we've found uh, that then means that we, we would prefer not to have to let people down because of the unavailability of attendees. Mm -hmm. If we have paid staff, then we also have make, we also make sure that there is a a backup uh, available if someone calls in sick. Uh, so basically that is the reason why. And, and of course, aside from that, it's the the level of professionalism that this that we need this program to be. This is an important program for the community and we do not feel that it is um, doing the program justice by having it run by volunteers. The issue that we occasionally have is that the the workload becomes quite um quite heavy and then there is uh, an opportunity for volunteers to provide support um and that could be just with uh, mostly infrastructure type materials so making sure that the the the, the rooms are set up uh, that the um, appointments are made that follow-up phone calls are done those kind of volunteer uh, tasks, but the actual delivery of the program itself is done by um, paid staff. Yeah, that's um, great. The, I think Alum's asked a really great question for us to finish on to both yourself and also Ellie, and that is, in what ways do you think the guide will change or improve your practice and future work? And I think this is a really great question to finish on before I hand back over to Naomi. Um, maybe perhaps Ellie, if you wanted to go first and then followed up by Mika before we hand back over to Naomi. Thank you. Uh, by Ellie, you mean me?
Yes. Right. So, uh, um, do you want me to answer this question on behalf of Alia? Yeah, I think, well, you could probably do it on two levels, right? From the perspective of Alia, but in terms, say, of the types of projects that you look after, but you could also do it from the perspective of what you think, or how you think that um, it might change or impact on libraries. The thing is that, um, well, as a researcher, I can address this as a researcher myself who is very passionate about um, research into practice or bringing research and practice together. I think these types of jobs, um, this type of um, work, that um, a very real world problem is being investigated through a you know, academic research lens, um, they produce a result. They produce, we have seen a digital guide. It's a very tangible thing that our, you know, practitioner colleagues can get and use in their uh, work. What could be done um, from that perspective is testing that. And I think um, we saw that it was from Claire, perhaps. Um, we test that in different contexts and again, come to theory, right? So again, produce some theory, again, produce some understanding about the impact of this type of uh, product. So it's going from research to practice and then back to research again and again. To, so it's like a cycle. Don't stop at doing research and producing something, go uh, beyond that, research that again, research how that's, um, you know, impacting and how it could be improved. I, I, want, to, I want to add to Ali's, uh, if possible, uh, just a few sentences about the, um, it's, a, uh, it's not only the collections we see here and the programs, the importance of programs to the communities, so that's uh, uh, this is an excellent example is how the, uh, in the from the practice perspective and from the community libraries, they uh, to nurture the programs and from uh, very important from understanding of the needs of the communities. Like Baker said, we need to understand your community members, your demographics. I think that's very important uh, uh, point. Um, I believe. Thanks. Uh, and finally, Maker, before we hand back to Naomi. Um, so yes, in, in the way that our um, processes may change or improve um, following the, um, the the publishing of this guide, I think what it will have done, like I said before, this is actually just documented what our process is. And we've, we've had various documents and they were all a little bit here and a little bit there. It's never actually been put together in a guide the way we've done now. So in that regard, it is a documentation just of what we do. That said, I think we uh, we will now have a more formalized plan that we can use going forward with um, any future work that we do in this space. But then also, like I said, many other projects, it could actually be applied to uh, lots of other things as well. And the other thing that we are very conscious of and have been conscious of for a while, and again, not just for this project program, but also for others, is that we need to make sure that we evaluate and review what we've done. And that is formalized now as well. Um, and this is something that I believe certainly within our libraries, and I know from my network that it's the same with others. The review of what we have done is something where we fall short often and so this is this is where the loop needs to be closed and again this has been formalized now so um so it will actually serve as a really good reminder that that is something um we need to uh we need to make sure that that we we, we do that right at the very end right thanks very much for your comments there naomi over to you Fabulous. Thanks very much to all of our panellists and presenters today. And thank you very much to everybody who was able to attend today. And for those of us who are watching this recording at a later date, we really appreciate your support and interest in our research and the launch of this digital guide. We'll share the recording via email next week. Thank you again to our partner, Hume Libraries, and to Alia for funding this research. A uh, special shout out to Brendan Buckman, who's joined us today. He's our research assistant on this project. 
and his work was an invaluable foundation for the digital guide we've shared today. A thank you also to Associate Professor Mary Carroll, who's with us, and our colleague, Dr. Paul Murchia, who provided us with guidance along the way. Please do get in touch should you be interested in research and collaboration or have any further queries about the guide. But it's my pleasure to thank you once again for joining us and wish you a good day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.